um, the staff in the break so that they can put them on the boards. Okay, so we start with a talk from William Bowman on non-interference for free. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Excellent. So let's talk about writing secure software. Suppose I want to write a secure component E. E isn't a whole program. It will first be linked with several other components before it's run. For instance, E will be linked with this black box, which represents some high security data. We can imagine that E is a browser, and this black box is my database of passwords. E will also be linked with some untrusted context, C. We can imagine that this context, C, is a bunch of user-provided plugins to our browser. Now, C should be able to provide low security inputs and read the low security outputs of E, but C should never learn anything about our passwords. Well, this is an easy problem, right? As language experts, we know we should just use language-based security. So we pick our favorite language for reasoning about security, and we write E. The language guarantees that hostile contexts don't even type check. All the bad contexts are statically ruled out. And we get this because the language provides a non-interference guarantee. Non-interference is an equivalence property of any well-typed term in the language that states that when given the same low-level public inputs, but different high-level private inputs, that the low-level outputs, those that can be seen by anyone, including an attacker, are indistinguishable. So if I take the same program and I run it twice one with the same low-level inputs, but once with a database of real passwords and once with a database of bogus passwords, the attacker can't tell the difference at all. Now let me just point out this equivalence relation here. It's indexed by a label L, and this represents the low-level observer, the attacker. There's a more general version, but I'm only going to talk about the low-level observers in this talk. OK, so with E written in our favorite secure language, security solved. Huzzah, right? Well, not really. Because we write our program in this beautiful high-level language with all kinds of guarantees, and the, compi the compiler promptly throws them out. So all of these contexts that were ruled out in our source language are no longer ruled out, and they can just read our passwords. We write a secure program, but the one we end up running isn't secure. And this can happen even if the compiler is proven correct. Because correct normally means verifying the dynamic semantics of the language are preserved. So that is, if we have a program that evaluates to V in the source language, the compiler will guarantee the translation of that program evaluates to V plus, the translation of V in the target language. But even if a compiler satisfies this notion of correctness, it may not preserve equivalence guarantees like non-interference. We need to know that if we take a program and run it twice with different private inputs, the results are indistinguishable to the low-level observer. So if we want to use language-based reasoning, we need secure compilers, compilers that preserve our source-level reasoning to our target language. So how do we write a compiler that preserves non-interference? Well, Folklore suggests that non-interference can be captured by parametricity. The intuition for this is both are equivalence properties. If we stare at the theorems of both of them, they look very similar. If we take a look at the proofs, they are both proved using very similar logical relations style arguments. So can we show that non-interference in a security type language can be preserved by translating to a language without security types but with parametric polymorphism? And in fact, in an ICFP 2004 paper, C and Sandswick give a translation from the core calculus of dependency, which provides a non-interference guarantee, to system F. However, two years later, Shikuma and Igarashi show a counterexample for this, uh, demonstrating that this translation does not preserve non-interference. So this is the line of work that was the starting point for our paper. So we're going to give a translation from DCC into SO, uh, system F omega. Now DCC is the core calculus of dependency. It captures a variety of dependency analyses, including information flow security. The language is essentially the simply typed lambda calculus plus a lattice of monads that allow you to encode dependency in your program. Now we're going to use system F omega as our target language because, well, we want parametricity. Uh, but as we'll see, the type constructors and the higher order polymorphism of F omega will be uh, important to our translation. So let's take a look at our source language. DCC provides this lattice of monads, so we can have terms like E1 that have monadic types, like TLS1, 
And this represents uh, some protected data, S1, that's protected at level L in the lattice. If we just imagine a two-label lattice, L could be high or low, H or L. So for instance, we can have the high-level Boolean values, A to H true and A to H false, of type TH bool. And these two values, despite having different underlying data, true and false, are indistinguishable to the low-level observer because they've been protected. So how do we use these protected monadic terms? Well, the language provides us with a bind form that says if you give me some protected data, E1, and a continuation that can use that protected data, I will unwrap it and bind that data to X and let E2 compute over it. So notice that while E1 has type TLS1, X just has type S1. So the protection has been pulled away. But of course, this type rule, as stated, isn't safe. E2 could just return X. So we need this continuation E2 to promise that its result is protected. So this judgment, pronounced S2 is protected at label L, ensures that any computation that depends on private data must be protected. Now, I'm not going to formally define this judgment, but let me give you a few examples. So we can't normally just return raw primitive data. Since that data is not in the monad, we can't track where it goes or how it behaves. For instance, we can never just return a bool. That wouldn't be safe at any label since that would always leak a bit of information. But one exception is unit. Since unit contains no information, returning unit is protected even at label H, at high. Now the most obvious way to protect data is just inject it into the monad. So if we're computing over some low data, we can just return the low monad, TL, TL8, uh, S. However, if we're computing over high data, obviously we can't return the low monad since that would be leaking high information down to the low observer. However, conversely, if we return the high monad, we can do that if we're computing over low or if we're computing over high data. And this encodes the idea that low-level data can flow higher into the lattice, but not vice versa. Okay, so this bind rule essentially provides DCC with its non-interference guarantee. Let's figure out how to translate it into F omega. Since the key to enforcing non-interference is in the type system, I'm just going to focus on the type translation. Most of the types are translated in the obvious inductive way, unit to unit, bool to bool, functions by structural recursion. But what about this monadic type? Well, since this bind rule essentially gives us non-interference, let's recall that. The idea is that E2, is this continuation, is allowed to compute over protected data so long as it promises to protect the result. So what we're going to do is translate this monadic type by CPSing it. And this will make the continuation, E2, from the bind rule explicit in the type system. So now we translate TLS into a polymorphic function that expects a continuation from S plus, the protected data, to some type beta, as long as beta is protected at level L. Now we can encode this constraint in the type system so that now we translate the monadic type and it expects a continuation from S plus to beta and a proof that beta is protected at label L. And the way we do this is with the high order polymorphism of F omega. Essentially, we introduce an ADT that models the protection judgment from DCC. This ADT, pronounced alpha prot, expects a representation of the label and some type. And it represents a proof that this type is, is protected at this label. So we're gonna use types alpha L, abstract types, to represent our labels. If we consider this type as a Haskell Gadget, we can look at it like this. We define some new type, alpha prot, which takes two arguments, a label and a type. And the constructors for this, this gadget model exactly the rules we saw before. So we can always introduce a, a term of this type for unit, since unit is always protected. Or we can return the monadic type if that type is protected at some label L, as long as the, uh, the label on the monad, L prime, is at least as high as the label of the data we were computing over L. So I'm not going to bother you too much with the details of how we encode this into the language. You can see the paper for that. OK, so that's our type translation. It's mostly inductive. Then we CPS the monadic type and ensure that only secure continuations can use protected data. I just want to point out one thing about this translation. We start with a closed type S in DCC. But the end result is an open type, S plus, that's open with respect to this alpha prot and these alpha Ls. This means that in our proof of non-interference preservation, we get to pick interpretations for these open types. And that's 
we, when we pick these interpretations, that's what allows us to encode non-interference via parametricity. Okay, so that's all I'm gonna say about the translation because the translation is not even the most interesting part of this work. The interesting part is actually proving that this translation preserves non-interference. And that's because proving non-interference is preserved is essentially the same as proving equivalence is preserved, as proving full abstraction. And this is a hard problem. To see why, let's just consider the case where we're trying to show equivalence of functions is preserved. So the standard way of proving equivalence preservation is to be, use a logical relation. The normal definition says that, well, if you want to show two functions are preserved, we assume we have some related arguments, and we must show we get related results. So I'm going to elide most of the types on this slide, but I'm going to leave the type of the argument here, S plus, this translation type, because it's going to become important in a minute. So we assume we have related arguments, M1 and M2, and we plug them into the translated function bodies, and we need to show that these results are related. We would like the proof to proceed about as follows. By assumption, we have related functions in the source language, so all we need to do is give them related arguments, like M1 and M2, and we get related results. By induction, the translation of those would be related QED. Except we can't exactly take target arguments M1 and M2, and plug them into source functions. They're totally different languages. So how do we say that since M1 and M2 are related at type S plus this translation type, there must exist some E1 and E2 that correspond to M1 and M2 and are related themselves at type S in the source language. That is, how can we take terms from the target language and back translate them to the source language? Well, that doesn't seem possible. Our target language is more expressive. It has polymorphism and type constructors, and well, DCC is practically the simply type lambda calculus. So typically in the literature, equivalence preservation proofs solve this in one of two ways. Either we can enrich the source language, just add all the features from our target to the source to bring them into closer correspondence, or we can impoverish the target, just throw out everything that doesn't already exist in the source. But neither of these is satisfying. We want to work with the established DCC and not artificially change it just to make our proofs go through. And we actually can't throw out anything from F omega since we're using both polymorphism and type constructors. Besides that, if we want our techniques to scale, we can't just artificially change our language, like add go to to my source language just because it exists in the, in the target. So we're forced to be clever. Now recall that when we assume M1 and M2 are related, we assume they're related at some source type uh, some translation type, S+. Plus. So we can use the types to restrict the terms we actually need to consider to just those that extensionally look like source terms. So for instance, if we have some, lang some lambda, some function in the target language of translation type, S1+, plus, arrow S2+, plus, we know that the X, the variable, is going to be a translation type, and the body M is going to be a translation type, so we can inductively back translate those and spit out a source function. But is this enough? Can we back translate everything just by this property? Well, if we consider application, here's an application that has translation type S plus, but that doesn't tell us that this subterm M prime has a translation type. So just using types isn't enough to tell us we, how we can back translate things. But for this term, at least, we could just do one beta reduction, eliminate M prime, and continue back translating. In the paper, we do this more generally. But the idea is that if we have a type translation that preserves equivalences, it will always let us eliminate all of these subterms that don't correspond to the source language because this term must extensionally behave like a source term. The one problem is now that it's no longer inductively defined, we actually have to prove that every term of translation type can be back translated. So we develop a novel logical relations argument for this. It's similar to proving strong normalization uh, via logic relation. Now with our back translation defined, we can finish our proof of equivalence preservation. So the first thing we do is we take these related arguments, M1 and M2, and translate, back translate them to related source arguments, E1 and E2. Then by assumption, we have related source functions, so we can apply them to related arguments and get related results, and by induction QED. Except that this proof relies on a whole bunch of logical relations. And I've sort of a little bit kind of glossed over a lot of details here. 
I'm not gonna tell you everything because that's in the paper, but let me point out one interesting uh, thing about our logic relations. So typically, a logic relation is defined on closed terms and then lifted to open terms by picking closing substitutions and closing all the free term and type variables. But recall that when we assume M1 and M2 are related at a translation type S+, plus, translation types are only well formed when they're open with respect to alpha prot and alpha Ls, with respect to our ADT. That is, we can't even state this assumption unless the logical relation leaves these type variables open. So, we build on the work of Zhao, Zhang, and Zanswick to develop a logical relation for F omega that's parameterized by an ADT. Now, our logical relation, even at its lowest levels, can contain terms that are open with respect to the term and type variables uh, from our ADT. Now, finally, modulo a couple other details, like how we interpret this ADT with respect to an observer, our proof is done. Okay, so in summary, if we want to use language-based reasoning, we need compilers that preserve the reasoning from our source language to our target language. We need compilers that can do this not just for dynamic semantics, but for complex relational guarantees like non-interference, and that can preserve it without artificially restricting our languages. This paper demonstrates how we can preserve non-interference via parametricity and develops techniques such as our back translation techniques that should apply to other equivalence preservation and full abstraction results. If you want to see the paper or more details in our tech report, you can see the, this link on my website. Thanks. Hi, hey, nice work. Uh, usually, no interference comes in different flavors, uh, depending on the attacker observational power. So I wonder, when you say no interference, if you refer like termination sensitive, termination insensitive, progress sensitive, et cetera, et cetera. Right, so we're focusing on um, terminating fragments of DCC here, so it is not termination sensitive. Um, we have uh, some ideas on how this might extend to terminating languages, um, but we haven't implemented any of that. Okay, thanks. Yep. Hey, nice talk. Um, have you um, compared to other ways of proving full abstraction, like say using trace semantics or other techniques that are out there? Right, so uh, I'm most familiar with logic relation techniques, um, but if we did want to scale this to languages with effects or uh, output or input output, stuff like that, um, it's likely that we need to extend this to something like trace semantics. Um, we haven't compared doing exactly these proofs to using trace semantics because, well, I'm most familiar with these logical relation techniques and they seem to work well in practice. Oh, so that our target language was more simple, like F, just F. Um, the target language is F omega, which is very expressive. Um, and I was wondering whether there's anything that one might express in the source language, uh, in a richer source language that could be translated into F omega. Uh, in a richer source language. Yes, so if we were to extend DCC with, for instance, type yeah. constructors. Um, so we hadn't considered that. Um, the pro there's two problems with that. One, we, like I said, we wanted to work with the established DCC, um, and I'm not sure how this would affect the non-interference properties of the source language if we were to just, just extend it. Um, okay. Sure. okay, thanks again. Thank you.